Hi, welcome back. In this, the last of my 10 data updates for data that I posted at the start of 2017, I'd like to talk about the missing piece. What's the missing piece? I've talked a lot about what makes some companies good and bad. I've looked at returns on capital, I've looked at costs of capital, I've looked at debt ratios and dividend policy, but my focus has been on separating good companies from bad companies. But for to make a judgment as an investment, as an investor looking at these companies, you have to look at the pricing. Or put differently, at the right price, I will buy the wrong company, and at the wrong price, I will not buy the right company. So you can have a good company that is mispriced, that you will not hold, and a bad company that's a good investment. So let's talk about pricing. In order to compare prices across stocks, what you will ver very quickly recognize when you start the comparison is absolute prices cannot be compared. And here's why. Absolute prices, in a sense, are arbitrary. That sounds like a strong statement, but here's why. Let's say you have a stock trading at $100 per share. You can make it trade at $10 per share by doing a 10 for 1 stock split, or a dollar per share by doing a 100 for 1 stock split. Berkshire Hathaway is not an expensive stock just because it's trading at $265,000 per share, and a penny stock is not cheap just because you can buy it for $0.03 cents a share. So in order to compare pricing across companies, you have to standardize the price. Sounds fancy, right? But a multiple is just a standardized price. In the denominator, or in the numerator, you usually have a measure of market value. That measure can be a market value of just equity. That's market capitalization of price per share. It can be a market value for the entire firm, which would be market value of equity plus market value of debt, though people cheat and use book debt. Or it can be a market value for the operating assets of the company where you take market value of equity plus debt minus cash. So what you're effectively doing is taking the non-operating assets, like cash or cross holdings and other companies, out of the equation. In the denominator, you have four choices. You can divide by revenues. Why? Because that's a number that you should be able to get for almost every company, or even a driver of revenues. What does that mean? Let's say you're a startup. You have no revenues, but you have users, and you think those users will lead to revenues. You can divide your market value by the number of users, the number of subscribers, the number of downloads. So you can do revenues or revenue drivers. You can divide by earnings. So those earnings can either be to equity investors, net income, or to all investors, which could be operating income. You can divide by cash flow. That cash flow can be to equity investors where you subtract out capex and working capital and debt payments, or it can be to the entire firm. In fact, the most common cash flow you might see in a multiple is earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Essentially, it's a collective operating cash flow for the firm. Or you can divide by book value. Book value of just the equity as the accountants see it, or book value of the entire firm, or book value of just the operating assets of the firm. You take book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. So you've got a numerator which captures what the market is willing to pay for a company, the denominator that captures what should be driving that number. Now there's one very simple rule you should try to follow whenever you use a multiple. It's called the consistency rule. If your numerator is an equity value, your denominator has to be an equity value as well. If your numerator is a firm or an enterprise value, your denominator is to be a firm or an enterprise value as well. So what are you talking about? Let's take P-E ratio, the most widely used multiple in the world. The numerator is an equity value, market capitalization of price per share. The denominator is earnings per share or net income, which is also an equity value. So thank God for small blessings. The most widely used multiple in the world is consistent. Enterprise value to EBITDA, similarly consistent. Numerator is a market value of the operating assets. EBITDA, as we pointed out, is a measure of operating cash flow. What would be examples of inconsistent multiples? Dividing price by EBITDA would give you an inconsistent multiple. Dividing price by sales gives you an inconsistent multiple. In fact, if you want to do a revenue multiple, you should probably divide enterprise value to sales. So watch out for that because I've seen inconsistent multiples slip through and if you use them, you're going to come up with conclusions that are not merited by the facts. So let's take these multiples and take a look at what the world looks like at the start of 2017. So we, with, each, with each of these multiples, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to first show you a histogram of that multiple. Sounds fancy, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to count the number of stocks with P ratio 0 to 4, 4 to 8, etc. And I'm going to put it on a distribution. And you see the distribution up here for pretty much the entire globe broken down by region into the US, Europe, Japan, emerging markets, and Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, and a global mix. You see, why are you putting all of those in the same graph? First, to show you how much they share in common. Look at this distribution. The first thing that jumps out at you, it's not symmetric, right? Why is that? Because a P-E ratio cannot be lower than zero. It's floored at zero, 
but it can be any number. It can be 15,000, 50,000. The right tail sticks out. It's an asymmetric or a skewed distribution. Let's say, so what? Whenever you have an asymmetric distribution, you have to be very cautious about using numbers like the average. And here's why. The average is going to get pulled out by outliers. So a much more meaningful number when you have an asymmetric distribution is the median. You can compare those across the world. The U.S. is the most expensive part of the world at the start of 2017, and Japan looks like the cheapest. I've given you the 25th and the 75th. Does this mean you should be loading up with Japanese stocks? Not necessarily, because remember, we talked about how fundamentals can drive these multiples, but at least you get a sense of what the distributions are across the world. Now, I decided to take a closer look by country. Here again, I've taken pretty much every country for which I could find companies that were traded and mapped out what their median P ratio is by country. Well, again, you can look at cheap and expensive. And you're going to start to notice a pattern that's going to play out with every multiple. The cheapest countries in the world right now are in Africa and Eastern Europe. And already you can see it. Well, they're cheap for a reason. They're risky countries. The most expensive countries in the world, you've got the U.S. and you've got China. You also have Argentina, strangely, and that might be something you might want to take a closer look at because Argentina is coming out of a deep fog, and that might explain the high P-E ratios, but you can already see the variations across the world. Now, I am a bit of a skeptic when it comes to P-E ratios. I know that people like to use them, but I don't trust P-E for three reasons. One is, I don't trust accountants, and that might be my personal bias. And the more you let accountants work with a number, the less trustworthy that number becomes, at least to me. And net income or earnings per share is after every conceivable accounting adjustment. So I'm a little wary about P-E ratios. Second, there is a sampling bias, and here's what I mean by the sampling bias. There were 42,668 companies in my overall sample, but only about 25,000 plus made it into that histogram that you saw. You're saying, what happened to the other 17,000? There were companies that were losing money, and I had to take them out of the sample because the P-E ratio is not meaningful when you have negative earnings. You're saying, that's okay. You still have 25,000 companies in your sample. True, but I've eliminated 17,000 companies that are probably younger, higher growth, more distressed, and that's going to create some bias in my averages and my sector numbers. That's something you need to keep in mind. And third, because of the focus on earnings per share and net income, the P-E ratio is the most volatile number you can think of. It moves the most on a year-to-year -year basis, which makes it much more difficult to actually use as a basis for finding cheap and expensive stocks. Let's look at price-to-book ratios. What I'm doing here is I'm dividing the market cap of a company by the book value of equity. So I'm staying consistent. And here again, you can lose some companies if the book value of equity is negative. But you can already see that you're going to lose far fewer companies because the book value of equity is negative. Only about 10% of companies rather than the 40% that you saw with earnings. Here again, peak to the left, tail to the right. It's a skewed distribution. Again, looking across markets, you see the familiar pattern. The, the United States has the most expensive stocks trading roughly at two times book value. In Japan, looks cheap. It's trading at less than book value. But again, be careful what you do next. Japanese stocks look cheap, but there might be a very good reason why they trade at less than one. The price to book is less than one. And you'll have to look at those reasons before you jump in. Now again, looking across countries, you see the pattern unfold again. The cheapest countries in a price-to-book ratio are in Africa and Eastern Europe. The most expensive is China, and again, Argentina shows up. You can and, and Venezuela, which is interesting, and there the reason for the high price-to-book might be the book value is just depleting at companies, and the market cap is actually staying above that book value. But again, you can look across the world and you can see that there are big chunks of the world, the U.S. and Canada, Australia, where stocks traded between one and a half to two times book value. That seems to be the median for developed markets, but in emerging markets, you see either much lower numbers, as you see in Africa and Eastern Europe, or in some cases, higher numbers, as you see in China and Argentina. And those could potentially be explained by higher growth. Now, let's look at the EV to EBITDA. This is a multiple that has taken off over the last 30 years. It's a multiple that's gone from being very lightly used in the mid-80s to being almost a third of all equity research in 2016. Again, you see the skewed distribution. And again, when you compare across markets, you see now that emerging markets look like the most expensive markets, slightly more expensive than the U.S., 11.91 EBITDA median. And 
you know, Japan and um, Japan still looks like the cheapest market. So that becomes a constant pattern. And Australia, New Zealand, Canada are the next cheap at 8.85 times EBITDA. You can already see how your view of a market can shift depending on the multiple you use to look at that market. Finally, looking across countries, again, Eastern Europe and Africa have the cheapest the cheapest markets. If you look at EV to EBITDA, China looks pretty expensive. Again, China's looked expensive on pretty much every multiple. Make of it whatever you want, but you might still look at the fundamentals before you jump in and do something rash with these numbers. Finally, looking at, you know, looking at um, EV to sales, why do we look at revenues? So this is the multiple on which you should lose the least companies. The financial service companies, it's a little messy thinking about what revenues even mean. It's probably the least skewed of the distributions. You don't have that peak to the left and tail to the right, a much more spread out distribution. And the most expensive market in the world on a revenue multiple basis is Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, four times revenues. Now, the cheapest market in the world you know, is Japan still. So Japan you know, has been cheapest in every single multiple. Looking across countries again, China's expensive. By now, this is a familiar pattern. The cheapest markets are in Eastern Europe and Africa, and the rest of the world looks pink and yellow. So you can make your own judgments by looking at the countries and taking a deeper look at why those multiples might have the level, or might be trading at the levels that they are. So let's close the process off by now looking at what these multiples look like across sectors. So here's what I did. I took trailing PE. I've already told you why I'm suspicious of multiple, but since everybody uses it, I said, let's take a look at what the median PE ratio is by sector, and then look at the 10 cheapest sectors and the 10 most expensive. Based on the trailing PE, here's what it looks like. A lot of financial service companies look cheap. Banks, insurance companies, reinsurance companies. A couple of real estate groupings, oil and gas. And so you can see that these are, these are sectors where companies trade between 10 and 13 times earnings. Most expensive, again, you're probably not surprised. A lot of drug, you know, software companies, drug companies, both biotech and pharmaceutical, are trading at much higher multiples than the rest of the market. Online retailing, trading at about 26 times, you know, uh, uh, trailing earnings. So you, 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 you might not be surprised, but again, I wouldn't use this as a basis for just running out and buying the cheapest sectors and selling the most expensive. To me, this is the basis for where I'm going to go looking for individual companies. And my taste is still to do intrinsic valuation within these sectors. Now, one of the most useful things you can do when you look at a multiple is not just compare across sectors at a point in time like I did in the previous graph, but to look at how a sector has changed over time. So as an example, Here's what I did with the pharmaceutical and biotech companies across time and have essentially tracked the aggregate EV to EBIT. No, no, and this might sound like a strange multiple. It's earnings before interest taxes and R&D. I said, why are you doing that? Because R&D is really an operating. It's not an operating expense. It's a capex. I should be adding it back. So this is a rough measure of what multiple of pre-R&D earnings, pre-R&D operating income I'm paying for companies. And I've graphed out pharmaceutical companies versus biotech companies in the U.S. Just to provide an illustration of how cross-time comparisons can be useful. Here's what should jump out at you. If you look at 1998, 99, 2000, biotech companies used to trade at premiums of 100 200, to 200% above pharma companies. What does that mean? If a typical pharmaceutical company trades at nine times earnings before interest taxes and R&D, a, a biotech company used to trade at 24, 25, 26. You look at the, the trend lines over time, it's clearly, this, the shift is dramatic. And what you see is, especially as you get to the more recent years, that the premium you're paying for biotech companies has dropped off towards zero. At the end of 2016, for instance, that premium was 16%. Now, there are two ways you can read this. One is if you're a firm believer in mean reversion, you can just buy biotech companies and hope they go back to pre-2006 premiums. But I think that'd be a dangerous thing to do. Because there are fundamental reasons why the premium has faded. Biotech companies are larger. Perhaps the profitability difference is narrowing. The healthcare business is changing. So this is actually an interesting way to take subgroups of companies and play them out. I've tried this with old tech and new tech, partly to show the fact that old tech companies, these are companies that are more than 20 years old as a technology, are actually cheap. It's, a, it's the new tech companies that are pushing up 
the multiples at which technology companies trade. So it's going to allow us to make some judgments about subgroups and look at why they're changing over time and perhaps, perhaps find some investing opportunities. So I'm going to close with three thoughts. The first is, uh, when I look at people doing pricing, I understand why they're doing pricing. I find it surprising how many people still stick with absolute rules of thumb. What am I talking about? A stock that trades at less than book value is cheap. A peg ratio less than one is cheap. A stock that trades at less than six times EBITDA is cheap. I don't know where these rules of thumb come from, but they're not just dangerous, but lazy. I can understand using a rule like that 50 years ago when you could not access the data and working with the numbers was very difficult because you didn't have the tools. Today, you can look at the entire distribution. Why not replace absolute rules of thumb with relative rules of thumb? What am I talking about? Instead of saying six times EBITDA is cheap, why not look at the distribution of EV to EBITDA multiples, like I did, across the market, and say the 20th percentile is what's cheap. And the 20th percentile might give you an EV to EBITDA of 4 or an EV to EBITDA of 8, depending on how the market is being priced. Playing the pricing game, at least play it right. Second, most stocks that look cheap deserve to be cheap. So don't use any of these multiples as your end game. It's the start of the game, not the end of the game. Because when you find a stock trading at a low P, it's your job to ask the right questions. What's the growth? What's the risk? What kind of return on equity does this company earn? And finally, if you're paying a price, whether you like it or not, you are estimating the future. The reason I say that is, as many of you know, I'm a believer in intrinsic valuation and DCFs, and I'm often taken to task by people who say, hey, why are you trying to forecast the future? It's impossible. And these are the same people who seem to have no qualms playing 50 times revenues for Snap. If you pay 50 times revenues for Snap, whether you like it or not, you're making implicit assumptions about the future. Future what? Future revenue growth, future margins. In fact, the difference between me and you is I'm being explicit about my assumptions and you can take them apart, whereas you're being so implicit about your assumptions, you might not even be aware about the assumptions you're making. And that strikes me as a very dangerous place to be. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you found this useful.